It is important to have a good relationship with your sewing technician. Unfortunately, they are getting fewer and farther between as they retire. Luckily for us, there's a new breed of technicians coming through, like my next guest, Katie Matthews. Working from her store in Southampton, UK, she is helping customers, schools, and cruise lines by maintaining and repairing their machines. And on my cruise to Iceland next year, she will be the sewing tech on board. I had a lot of questions about her journey and how she became a technician, or as the Brits say, sewing engineer. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here's my interview with Katie Matthews. Welcome, Katie, to the show. Can you please let everyone know where in the world you're coming to us from? Yes, I'm in Romsey in Hampshire, and we're in the UK, in the south of England, uh, very close so, to Southampton. So that's just right where we're going to be going out on our cruise next year, right? It is. I'm very, very excited about that. It's such an amazing opportunity for us to be able to be part of it. So how long have you had your store for? Uh, so we've had the shop for 18 months. Previous to that, I was service and repairing machines, and I was going out to people's homes, picking up, collecting. Um, and then returning. Then COVID hit, it changed my business up. And that obviously the way I had to work, I was collecting from you know, safe places that people have put out the sewing machines behind their bins. And I was collecting them and disinfecting them and taking them back. And, and it just grew and grew and grew from there. So a lot more people started sewing because obviously that people were at home a lot more. They got their sewing machines out and they were finding, well, they've been packed away for a couple of years and they weren't working or that they hadn't maintained or looked after them. Uh, so the business just grew from there, really. From there, I took on, I've got about 30 school um, and educational contracts that I do throughout the year, trying to space it out throughout the year. So I go along to the schools. Sometimes I'll do it on site and service their machines. Um, sometimes I'll pick them up and bring them back. It sort of grew from there and it's just got bigger and bigger and bigger. I found that it's quite a, a dying trade. Predominantly, it is male. I believe I'm one of the only female engineers in the UK. If someone is an engineer, <laughs> reach out to me. But yeah, it's predominantly male and, and older men because it seems to be a, a trait that's kind of passed down in the family. I agree with you. It It is a dying skill. Most of the sewing techs that I find here in my area are all older gentlemen, um, often retired, and they're still just yeah. doing it on the side. Yeah. And and, that, and that's just, I think that's the same throughout, especially you know in the UK, it is older gentlemen that are servicing machines. I think that it's it's also keeping up with the times because now you've got the newer sewing machines and we've got the sewing computers and and you and you have to constantly be training and learning all the new things. And we're a, a dealer for um, Benina and, and they're sewing computers, so so you have to know about the electronic sides of it as well. We, and it's wonderful because I see sewing machines that are 150 years old and then the next one I'll go to will be a new machine, all singing, all dancing, computerised machine. So every day is different. How did you get into servicing sewing machines? Okay, it's a little bit of a, a long story. In my family, I've got I come from a sort of a long line of, of, of sewers then. My grandmother sewed and, and I remember when I was younger, I used to go along to the uh, the old chap in the sewing machine shop and, and get the machine service. So I've had it in my family, you know, sewers, and our family's very, very creative. And then I met my partner. So I said, well, what, what do you do for a living? And he said, well, I service and repair sewing machines. And I, I, I couldn't believe that. I, thought, I kind of knew that that job existed, but it's not something, especially, you know, I, I'm older as well. And it's not something that you would sort of encourage to do it or be taught about at school that it's even a job. So I felt I was very intrigued by it because obviously being creative myself and having a sewing machine, I really kind of wanted to know a bit more about it and, and what it is. It wasn't his sort of main jobs, but he used to own sewing machine shops. So this has been passed down from his grandfather. So he knew all the old tricks of the trade for the old sewing machines, um, which is, is fantastic because you, you don't get taught that these days. So yeah, it, it's come through Ben. I got involved in that. And at the time I was working in the ambulance service on the front line. Uh, this was before COVID. I worked really, really hard to, to get into the ambulance service, but I found that it was taking its toll on me and on my mental health. And I, I had small children and I just found that I needed something. I'm very creative. 
Um, but I needed something that would feed my soul, I think. With servicing and repair, if you'd said to me 10 years ago, that's what you'd be doing, I just wouldn't believe it. <laughs> but I absolutely love it. I, it's, it's, it's living the dream, really. I love it. So that's how I got in into it. And then I decided to go full time. And I remember saying to Ben at the very beginning, what, like I've had six machines this week. Where are all these machines coming from? Like, I just couldn't believe the amount of machines. And now actually behind me in my workshop, I think I have near on 60 waiting for repair. But I'm very, very busy. A sort of increase lately in people retiring, especially in my area. So I've, I've taken on work from other shops as well. You know, unfortunately closed down or they've retired or they've moved away. Really overnight, I've sort of tripled my customer base. I know that is a big concern here. Like we often talk about, oh, this guy, he's so old. Like if he dies, what happens to him? <laughs> like who's yeah. who's going to service my machine? Yeah. So was the road to learning how to repair a machine difficult? I think the hardest thing that I found in the beginning was mastering how to calibrate the tension. And I've got to be honest, that it took me a little while to work that out. Where every machine is different, you are learning things all the time. So I'm still learning. And I find servicing and, and repairing a certain machine in particular is a bit like a puzzle. So you have to be logic, you know, logically minded to, to kind of work out, okay, so what's happening here? And sort of to diagnose faults and that with a machine. Like I say, I work on really, really old servicing machines and brand new machines as well. It took some getting to grips with. There was a little bit of time. I thought, I don't know if I'm going to get this. Is this right for me? Uh, and yeah, well, I've never looked back. <laughs> that tension on the sewing machine. Like I remember in home ec classes, just being threatened with detention if you touched any of those dials. Yes. And I think so many of us have just grown up with that fear. But it's actually quite logical, as you say, if you approach it a certain way. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I, I always tell, I tell people, you know, if, if they go away, you can touch your te top, top tension, but just don't start tweaking with the bottom because it, it, I think tension's a bit like a balancing act. I always sort of say it's a bit like a scale and one's off and then the other one's off. So it's it's getting a balance of, of the two really with tension. And now I'm like, doo, 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 done. <laughs> I think attention is it's kind of a feel really. So you mentioned you came from a family of sewists. What kind of things did they make? So my family's are very entrepreneurial, I think. My grandmother, um, I remember when I was younger, she introduced me to the world of bananas. She had one of the very first electronic bananas that, that come out um, in 1986. And actually, my mum's still got the sewing machine now and she's still using it. And she wouldn't part with it for anything. A uh, beautiful machine. And she used to you know, do alterations for people. Um, I think at one point they were doing children's clothes and yeah, just pretty much everything really. So did you learn how to sew at an early age? Uh, I remember sewing on my grandmother's sewing machine from a very, very early age. And I think then I sort of carried it on, but got to teenager and it, I didn't think it was very cool anymore. And then I got my own house and I thought, yeah, I want to make some curtains. And I think that was the very first thing I did is I made some curtains and then it just went from there, really. Yeah. But I think it working in this environment and people come in and say, oh, you really inspired me to make things, but they inspire me as well because I see so many talented people and I'm always interested after I've done their machine, well, what sort of things do you make? And they sort of get out some projects and that they've been doing. And we have got some talented people out there really have. Isn't there? I'm always impressed mm. with how different people love to do different things. Yeah. You're talking about our Berninas. Our Berninas can do so many things now. Like some people just love to sew clothes. Some people just love to sew quilts, but within that, they like their machine to do different things like embroidery stitches or hidden stitches or the ways that they can make their machine sing. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm, I'm I'm a bit of a, a dabbler in everything. So I like to do a bit of everything. I've done a bit of dressmaking. At the moment, I'm doing sculpture embroidery. So working with water soluble fabric. I just don't get enough time to sit in front of my own machines at home and, and do it. But, getting, yeah. the time, getting the time. <laughs> yeah. So your partner, Ben, is from a long line of sewing machine repair. How quickly did that grab you in? I, th I think so almost straight away, I felt very intrigued by what he did when he told me that he serviced and repaired machines. And that's not why I'm with him. That was just a little added bonus. <laughs> I was like, oh, you like so 
going <laughs> he sounds cool so i think it obviously it's come from a, a you know a long line a family line of, of sewers his aunt and uncle have got a, a large sewing machine shop in wales his uh, cousin they're the owners and founders of horn cabinets so it everywhere it, all his whole, whole family are involved in the in the sewing world i think it was the first time i went up to his aunt and uncle's place in wales was what inspired me to have my own shop when i went in there it was just i just didn't know where to look <laughs> and it was they had all these tables laid out and just these machines on every table and i called it stay and play and you could just stay and play with the machine in fact i was so enthusiastic when i left i said to mum you have to buy one of these machines and she went and bought one. <laughs> and but yeah i think it was his is definitely his angie angela that inspired me to to set up my own place and i just thought you know this is living the dream it really is my shop's very different than theirs i would say well that's the wonderful thing about sewing shops is that they are all different yeah. personalities so just because you have three in a town doesn't mean you can't go to all three the the, the selection yeah. is quite different normally absolutely and i i try to stock things that i would call different things that you can't so i i had i seek out lots of sort of different bits and pieces to sell um and also same with the tutors as well um, I'm always online researching new tutors and um, yeah, we've had some really, really amazing people in here to teach, which is great. So as Sorry. a mother of four, starting a business outside your home, was that daunting? Yeah, well, I'm actually a mum of six because Ben has two children. I have four. So we've got six between us. Wow. So I said mum of six. <laughs> it was very, very scary. Although I've, I've always kind of been business minded, a little bit of wheeler dealing here and there. <laughs> online I used to sell things and different things I've made things in the past and sold at craft fairs and, and that sort of thing I've never what I would call have a grown-up business so yeah it was coming out from working full-time in the ambulance service to moving over and actually servicing repairing and dropping off to homes is one thing but having a premises is a totally different thing and I remember the night before I got the keys I just couldn't sleep for worry thinking is anyone going to come into the shop why would they come here? Um, fortunately, I had a little bit of a customer base before I opened. But actually, when I opened the shop, I had not a single sewing machine for sale. Not a single machine. I just opened the doors. <laughs> I had a few bits and pieces. I had bobbins and you know, sort of your necessities. But I didn't have a single sewing machine. I had. I was desperate trying to get Benina. Um, I wanted to be a dealer for Benina. So that was my first thing. I think I, I badgered them for about 18 months. And then I sent them a video and said, this is the setup, <laughs> you're missing out sort of thing. So I got Benina, which is like my first real achievement really, because I've, I've, I've been brought up Benina, I love, love the brand. Yeah, so they were the first machines I had in here. I also do Husqvarna and Burnett as well, machines, and I sell pre-loved machines. So quite often people will come in and part exchange their machine, I will do them up and then people can buy at a more affordable price, which is, which is a good option really. So do any of your kids work in the store? No, they don't actually. And I'm trying, <laughs> trying to get them in here, but no, they don't. My youngest daughter is very, very creative and she sews, but on her terms. So she's a coming up teenager, but, but she's very, very creative. So maybe when she's a little bit older, she's sensible enough. She'll come in in half terms um, and school holidays and, and help out. And she likes it, but she's not quite, quite that old enough yet to leave her on her own. So. <laughs> Well, I'm just looking at the the beautiful wallpaper you have behind you. Everybody should know that this is wallpaper. It's not a <laughs> a, a fake screen. Mm -hmm. Your your store must be so colorful. It must just be full of color. You know, I can't wait to see the store just because I know it's a, a store filled with color. How many people get pulled in from the from? I'm in a quite an unusual location, so I'm actually um, on like a, an industrial estate of other businesses. So from the outside, it's very bland. Apart from when you turn the corner and you see my doorway. And at the moment, I know you're all crazy on the full uh, decorations in the States. But in the UK, we're not so much, but I am. So outside, I've all got it done up outside. I normally have like an archway or something out there. And then when you enter, people are like, whoa, I didn't expect this. <laughs> I thought I was just coming to like a dirty workshop to drop my machine off. But yeah, it's a burst of colour. And I can't, that's what I wanted because I wanted it to be a, a really nice... A bright environment to make you know people feel inspired to get creative and I hopefully I and mean, a lot of people say by the time they leave they've normally got a project 
<laughs> waiting to be done. But yeah, that that was the aim of it really, because I found that a lot of sewing machine shops were, especially in the UK, quite clinical and quite bland. And it, it just was quite uninspiring when I've been to quite a few and sort of looked around. I don't know whether without being sexist, that's because they are predominantly male for sewing machine shops. I, I think haberdashers are different. But I, yeah, I did find it quite bland, which is why I am a burst of colour in here. Even the lights are different colours <laughs> off the ceiling. So do you have your classes right in the middle of the store? Or do you have a designated sewing room, classroom space? Yeah, so everything is happens in one room. So my servicing repair, this is so this is this, uh, like a, a, a wall put up behind. So my workshop is just behind here. I'm sat in the workshop space area. So this is where the workshops happen. And then the other side is the shop. So we are all in one space so people can come around see what I'm doing if they want to watch what, what's happening I've got the workshops going on and also the shops open as well so I've got people coming in and out I think it would it works better that way to have it all in one space and actually be in the shop especially if you're at a workshop and you need materials or even just people just coming in they, they like to look and see what people are creating so it's quite nice to be in that sort of space sometimes we haven't got a group on people customers might come in and we we'll sit down and have a cup of tea and it's just a nice, warm, sort of welcoming place, really, that hopefully everyone feels like a nice, safe environment that they can, you know, come and offload if they want to. <laughs> Sit down and have a cup of tea with us. Now you've got your store and you've been a tech in the past and you're selling sewing machines, both new and old. What are the big steps that every person that buys a new sewing machine should know for their machine? Okay, so number one, I would say is definitely how to maintain your machine at home. Um, so I've got a, a Facebook uh, group on Facebook where I actually did a live video. So I, I don't do live things generally, but it seems like that's where things are going. So I thought, okay, I'll do a live video because I get a lot of people come in and say, well, well I don't know where to oil my machine. I don't know how to take the needle plate off and give it a clean out and a defluff. So I've done a live video on that. And people have I've just had hordes of emails coming into me saying, oh, it's amazing. I now know how to look after a machine. And it just keeps it going in between servicing caring for your machine and maintaining your machine at home would be definitely number one maintenance of your home machine is not onerous it's fairly straightforward isn't it it is fairly straightforward and your manual will tell you everything that you need to know wherever you've got to oil it how to take the needle plate off and yet it is you know five minutes at the end of a week after you've done a big project and that's all it takes and it yeah it, it's easy really is but it'll just keep that sewing machine going a lot longer i always say to people the sewing machine's a bit like a car so if you're not going to maintain it and oil it don't expect it to work in a year's time it's been sat in a cupboard and you take it out and it's not working and i would say the majority of the machines that i do are the machines that haven't been maintained i always advise people to read their user manual but i'm embarrassed to say that <laughs> i got mine out last <laughs> night and it's amazing how much i forget do you find it hard to get your customers to read the user manual? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, no one really reads manuals. Uh, quite often they'll come in and say, oh, actually, I didn't realize it did that. <laughs> so there's a lot of things. I would definitely advise reading the manual. Uh, there's always hints and tips that I'll show people as well that won't be in the manual, but that's just things that I've learned over time and a, and a sort of easier, a better way of doing it. But generally, read the manual. I think maybe part of it is the manuals are written by engineers and not by people that just want to sew. Hundred percent, hundred percent, yeah, definitely. And sometimes they say people say to me, "Oh, that's not in the manual." I said, "Well, don't worry about that. If it's not in the manual, I'm telling you, you need to do that now." Or, you know, quite often um, when you actually look at manuals, I don't really, very rarely look at manuals because I'm, I'm. Do, you know, sort of service and repair. But quite often, it actually in some manuals, it doesn't tell you how to maintain your machine. I have one machine that I have to dig through, but it's written from a different point of view that you'd think yeah. that maintenance should be front and center. Like, you, here's how to start it, but next week, this is what I want you to do, as opposed to having it buried in the back under troubleshooting. Yeah, definitely maybe put it in a different color or have a thumbnail attached to the side so yeah. you know exactly where you need to yeah, go. Yeah, that, that is exactly what it is. Like say, it's written by engineers, but I feel like customers can relate to me because I sew as well. I can sort of describe things and explain things in a way to them that they'll understand. You know, I, I don't think, I mean, part of that might be female and maybe they feel a bit more comfortable. I'm not sure. 
but yeah. Now you have been featured in magazines, national and local for your work with your community. What what are those things that you do out in the community that gets you on the headlines? I think people have, have fascinated generally. I get a lot of people come get hold of me because I'm a female engineer. And that that's the main thing, isn't it? It surprises people. So I think that is the main reason why people contact me, if I'm honest. Um, my workshops and classes, and we do a lot of socials to help with their mental health. So I think that that's the main, you know, the main drive for me in having a workshop. And I don't earn a lot of money from from having to the workshop space in my shop, but it is is there because I feel when I used to work out in the community a lot in the ambulance service, I would come across a lot of people that were very lonely or they'd lost their husbands or, you know, it don't even have to be older people. It could be younger people that feel quite isolated. And this was before COVID even happened. So I was always sort of looking for things and things to start up for people so they could feel welcome and just come to a place. And sometimes when they come to my groups, they don't even bring a project. They just come and they sit and they talk about what they're doing and someone else might be making a quilt and they say, oh, I really fancy getting back into the quilting again. And and it just inspires people. I've had quite a few people actually come and said, well, it's not just helped my mental health, it's helped my physical health. And I've been to my consultant again and he said, whatever you're doing, keep doing it because you are so much better than when I last saw you. And that's purely coming out being social two great things, socializing, drinking tea, well, free, <laughs> and sewing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and as well, I, I feel like it's helped me because I, I was in the ambulance service. My mental health declined. I mean, I used to deal with a lot of pretty bad jobs. And doing this job has helped me no end. Just to get, get out of the house, when I first started it, I felt a bit deflated thinking, what am I going to give back to the community? Because I've always been someone that's worked within the community, helping others. And I and I said to Ben once, well, what am I going to do by helping them with their machine? And now it's all sort of clicked into place. I'm like, yeah, this is where I need to be. Because I still feel like I'm helping people. And it, it might only just be fixing their machine. But, you know, that, that helps with their mental health. It feeds their soul, so... I think that's one of the big things that we learned in COVID. Like we knew it before, but we COVID really brought out how EMS people, nurses, doctors are all on this front line and you're part of somebody's worst day every day. And then when an emergency like the pandemic comes, you're asked to give even more and how important hobbies are to fill you back up. It must be so hard. And so draining. Do you have many any former workers that have come in to join you? Not here because I used to. I've actually moved to Hampshire from Dorset. Okay. I have had people that I used to work with buy sewing machines from me, and then we get them back down to to where I used to live. But I do get a lot of people that work for the NHS come in, a lot of doctors, nurses, consultants, and they do so. They do so, but they always say, "I wish I could spend more time sewing." And it's, I think it's their release. You find more men are coming in. Yeah, we get quite a few men actually coming in. We don't get so many to our social groups. We've had a couple come and go. Um, and I'd like to to have more men come in um, to our social groups. But I think it's well, probably about 80, 85% women. But we, yeah, we, we do get some men come in and we I, I fix their machines. <laughs> it's, it's just funny how... When I was a child, women did the sewing and men did not. But then in if you went into garment factories or into industry, men sewed all the time. Mm. It, they just didn't sew in the home. There's been a whole generation here that has lost the ability to sew. And it's really wonderful seeing everyone, not just girls, but boys and everything in between, come, come back to it. Yeah, definitely. Which is why I love servicing for schools, because there's a, a large majority, sadly, that don't have the funding for their textiles departments. To When I get the school machines in, it, it's it's just a real pleasure to work on them, really, because you know they're going to go back and the children are learning oh, it's vital skills, isn't it? Yeah, glue gun is not a good way to hem pants. No. <laughs> <laughs> I had the opportunity to be the hero and my daughter, she she didn't have a big wedding, but her her fiance got a pair of really cute cufflinks 
to wear for the ceremony, but he didn't have a French cuff. He just had a button cuff. I knew how to put in a buttonhole so he could wear them on his wedding day. Did you do it by hand? No, I did it with my Bernina. <laughs> and I always laugh because buttonholes are are often this thing that you work to attain and it's really very easy yeah it is i would say um buttonholes um is definitely hot on the on the high end list of where people need to learn and you'd be surprised at how many people don't know how to do buttonholes i mean with a banana you just put the foot on press the button and off we go and it's no more complicated with a basic mechanical machine uh, it's just almost going back to the manual sitting down with your machine and just working your way through the manual but buttonholes are, yeah, they're easy. Do you do a lot of online sales? I do not sell sewing machines online. I only sell sewing machines in the shop. And the reason for that is, is I like to offer that personal service. So when people come into the shop, I can find a sewing machine to fit their needs. So for me, it's not all about having the sale and off they go. I mean, they're my customers for life. So I'll look after them. There's no silly questions. They can come in and I will provide all the servicing, the repairs. We do free lessons for you um, if you buy a machine for us. You just can't get that online. I say that's one of the most important relationship in your spam with your hobby. If Every you don't time. like the local dealer, you'll have a hard time with your machine. Yeah. People don't realize is that if they buy online, especially in the UK, and they're buying from someone 300 miles away, that person they're buying from is responsible for the repairs and warranty for your machine. So quite often they'll have to send it back and be shipped back to the original person. Whereas here, if they buy from us, it's all done on site. So the machine doesn't have to be taken anywhere. There was 60 machines in the back. How long is your lead time on repairs? Um, at the moment, it's four weeks. I um, my, my colleague's actually on holiday, so I'm in the shop on my own. But normally my colleague's in the shop and I'm in the workshop. But I'm working day and night at the moment. So once we've finished up here, I'll go home, have some dinner, and then I'll be back into my double garage and I'll be working until 11.30. At night. Wow. At night. Those are a lot yeah. of hours. Does yeah. Ben work in the business with you? So day to day on a daily basis, he's got he's also got his own own business, another family business, not sewing related, but he is the B of K and B sewing machines. So he also helps out with the service, especially when it gets gets too much. I think when I first started servicing, the lead time was about a week from drop off to pick up. And now it's gone to fall. Yeah, if someone comes in and they're desperate and they need to get that trousers, the, the trousers finished and it's just a tweak of the tension, I'll do it for them and then off they go and then they bring it back again to get it serviced. I'll try and keep everyone's going, but it's it's like juggling plates, really, or spinning plates. <laughs> so what are you doing to avoid burnout now? How do you say no? I don't say no to my customers, but I make them aware of how long it's going to take if it comes into me. There's no other options around here. So they're quite limited built up a really good reputation as well. So a lot of people say, that's fine. I'll wait two months as long as you can look at it. So yeah, Sundays is my day off. So Sundays and Mondays officially, but Mondays I generally do school machines, but Sundays, um, I'll have all day Sunday. The housework can wait. I'll get a cleaner in <laughs> and I just sit down and say, I've recently joined a quilting group myself. <laughs> I've never done any sort of quilting. I've only done like jelly roll, zipping up to gown together. I thought I really want to do some quilting. There's a lady we've known for a long time and she's very, very knowledgeable. She's been quilting in this area for a long time. So I've recently started going to her class. I think I'm the youngest person there. I absolutely love it. It's so nice. And it's just, it's two hours every week and it's those two hours that I can put aside in the morning I think, oh, but I've got to get my sewing machine packed up and I've got to get all this. When I get there, it's just lovely. I could just sit there with a cup of tea because it's just two hours of just doing something for me. And it's having that time out, isn't it? So going out somewhere yeah. to do it is quite nice. And I've never really done that before. I like to do workshops and things like that. In fact, I'm doing one on Sunday, um, a textile printing workshop. It's one of the tutors that come into the shop and um, she's uh, invited me over to her barn to do some painting because I haven't done it in the shop. I missed out. And I service a machine, so what? I'm going over there. So it's like a little retreat day for me. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> You sell sewing machines, you repair sewing machines, you have a classroom and you bring in tutors. Do you sell fabric and haberdashery too? Yeah, so we've started selling bits and pieces. So we do um, Tilda fabric, 
Uh, we've just got their new range in, which is hibernation. I don't know if you've you've seen the new range. Yes, Kim. I've seen that. Beautiful. And I've kept my finger away from the buy button, but it's been tempting. <laughs> so we've got the range of, yeah, so we've got the range of, just having a look now. So we've got um, the Tilda Cotton Beach uh, range. We've got hibernation. We've got the Daisy range um, and the Chic Escape. I've only just started stocking fabric, so I've caved in. And people have said, oh, can you do fabrics? There's a, a few people around this area that sell fabrics. But I like to sell nice quality things. So I've sort of, I've dipped my toes in the fabrics. But generally we do, we sell um, Oracle thread. That's our most popular, I would say, thread wise. Um, we sell needles and bobbins and all the sewing tools you can imagine. Um, we do fat quarters, uh, sewing machine bags. We do merchant and mills. Mm. We sell their nice scissors and bits and pieces like that got a local artist and we we sell her work and she um, makes silver necklaces and earrings but sewing machines so it's all sewing machine it's all sewing related how far are you from the cruise terminal about 20 minutes it, it's, it's funny because um I, i've been over to the states i've not been to Ghana, but i've been to the states and i see in absolute awe their quilting shops and their joannes and hobby lobby and me and my mum used to go out quite regularly and just be like, oh, there's so much. We don't know what to buy. There's and I think so much. In the UK, we we are very limited on what we can get our hands on. So I said to Ben, I hope they're not disappointed because they used to go into these massive shops. <laughs> Part of it is having, buying local. So like if you have Tilda and you have Liberty, um, make hours there. William something is there as well, isn't it? William Morris. Well, William Morris is under license to a couple of people, but I think there's another line that you have there. Like they're, they're English lines. That's what I'm always interested in. You know, I can okay. buy Kona solids here at home. I don't need to buy them when I'm on a trip. Yeah. But those interesting things like the merchant and mills patterns. I think, I things think the like merchant that. and mills is amazing. Uh, that's really popular. Yeah. Like their little scissors. Cause you can buy like the little baby bow scissors and yeah. And that's the sort of thing I love their packaging as well. They do such a good job of branding. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? And that's often what we associate with Europe as well. You talk about working on machines that are over 100 years old. You can find them in the in the US and Canada, but the majority of them are you know, less than 100 years old or or even post World War II. If you find a place that's 100 years old here, that is a long time. That is really old. Yeah. Where for you, it's just what the age of the house that you live in. You know, that's actually maybe even quite young. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I sell a very popular, still the hand singers, pre-loved machines. So I, I pick them up and do them up and give them a bit of a makeover. In fact, I've got one just behind me. And they're really popular and people love, love the hand singers. Somebody watching wants to become a service technician. Yeah. What is the path to becoming one? So if you wanted to become a sewing machine engineer, you would have to go in as an apprentice. Um, there's lots of um, dealers and shops that are advertising um, and crying out for people because it, it's a dying trade. So you'd have to go in as an apprentice and do it that way. You couldn't just go to the individual brands and become an engineer. That comes later. So once you're then set up and you know the ins and outs of the sewing machine, then, and you only work for a company that sells that brand, then they will train you up to work on their brands. And, and that's how it works. Because it's a trade that has been passed down through generations, there's no official qualification in the UK to become a sewing machine engineer. And I've been fortunate that Ben has passed to me all his skills from working on the older machines that has been passed from his grandfather. So I've been fortunate you know, to have those skills passed to me. Whereas now, if you entered you know, into this job, then you wouldn't be able to get those skills as easy because they don't do yeah, the So training. much of it's not written down, is it? And a lot of it is learning on the job as well. But you have to be logically minded. So how difficult is it to service the older machines? Like, are the parts still available for them? Are they easy to find? So a lot of parts aren't available anymore for the older machines. We've got what we call a sewing machine graveyard as in our double garage. <laughs> so we strip, we've got a lot of old sewing machines and we strip parts and we keep everything. We've got drawers and drawers full of, of old parts 
and that's what keeps these old turn machines going yeah a lot of they get to a certain age um and then you can't get the parts anymore for them can you 3d print any of the parts or are they normally metal and you can't do that some are plastic, some are metal. I've actually got an old Benina that I can no longer get a part for. And it's the only part in the whole machine that's actually plastic and has broken. One of my customers' husbands actually does 3D printing. So I'm going to get him to 3D print that part for me. But yeah, generally, it is quite difficult to get hold of parts. And they're not a universal part. You can't just get a cog from one machine and it will fit into another machine. It doesn't work like that. So it is very difficult to get hold of parts. And quite often when people come in with their old machines, we'll take them into part exchange. And I know that this machine is going to help probably 10 other customers keep their machines going. We'll come right. back and strip it for parts and, and keep theirs going as well. So, Well, thank you so much for being with me, Katie. If people want to get a hold of you, how did they find you? So my website is uh, KMB Sewing Machines. That's who we are. So you can find us at www.kbsewingmachines.co.uk. And also we've got a Facebook page and a Facebook group. And we're KMB Sewing Machines on Facebook. And if they want to meet you in person, you are going to be on the cruise next year to Iceland, right? Exactly. I'm very excited about that. Can't wait. Sewing, traveling, great. It's going to be fun. Thank you so much. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Katie Matthews. I love that she put her mental health first and was able to pivot and find another career and grow it into the business that she has today. And if you are interested in joining us on the cruise to Iceland next year, follow the link on my website. If you are interested in more information about KMB sewing machines, their classes or repair service, I'll leave a link to the website in the video description notes below. And if you wanna join her Facebook or send her an email, I'll leave that contact information in the notes as well. Next time you're in your sewing room, be sure to have Karen's quilt circle playing in the background. I have interviewed so many interesting people on this series. Let one inspire you. And don't forget, you can now listen to this as a podcast on the YouTube Music app. Take care and I'll see you next time.